Hi. Thanks for coming. I'm Michael V. Smith. Most of you know that already. <laughs> and then a few of you now do. Um, so I, th I thought I, I would uh, not say very much, uh, read a whole, uh, whole bunch uh, very quickly, because the words are all small. It's easy to understand. Um, and then um, uh, take, we'll, we'll have like a little conversation afterwards, because uh, it's always nice to not just read for a, a whole hour and to, I don't know, see what is going on in your brains, because that's so much more interesting than what's going on in mine. I get so bored listening to myself. Um, so I'm going to read a little bit. I'm going to start at the beginning and just move chronologically the way through. You don't really need to know very much um, in advance. I'm going to give you tiny bits and pieces. But the main character that we start with, there, there are two. We're going to start with Helen. And Helen has driven out of town um, to her uh, deceased lover's grave. Um, and we're going to pick up when she gets to the grave. It's really only two pages in. I'm just saving you the boring part. It was an easy route despite the missing trail because Helen had only to walk parallel to the fenced property line. She could smell the apples sweet on the air and beneath that the damp earth through the grass and the hot fishiness of the river. She came to a clearing along the water's edge with three maples making a canopy over a large gray stone rising four feet from the ground. It was here that the Keegan family had buried their son's ashes at the base of the large stone overlooking the river. His name and inscription were carved in neat block letters a quarter inch into the face, Garrett Samuel Keegan. The grass had once been manicured to a point, but over the past years, since the politician and his wife had retired out of town, to not be reminded so often of what they'd lost, or to escape the pitying looks from their neighbors, Helen was the only one to keep the grass trimmed. Sometimes she would bring her hedge trimmers when she was lonely or wanted a good place to think, wishing herself back into a time that was easier, easier than now, with the dam forcing her hand. It's a power dam. She would sit at, a, at Garrett's grave, take up her place on the right, leaning against the stone, and run her fingers through the grass as though she were still tussling his hair in a park somewhere, wrapped alongside him. The heat of the sun was intense, even for the morning, she was sweaty by the time she reached the small clearing. Helen could hear the long, low rumble and whine of heavy machinery from a kilometer or so upriver. She had watched from this spot as they'd rerouted the river to the south with a coffer dam. Sorry. Uh, she had watched from this spot as they rerouted the river to the south with a coffer dam, then cleared the newly dry land of the boulders and detritus the river had buried under it. Hundreds had come down over those first weeks to see what their riverbed had looked like. There was an awesome magic in standing on the river bottom, which felt direct sunlight for the first time. Two years in, the concrete columns of the power dam were in place, looking like a giant's knuckles, the symmetrical fingers of a great machine. The tops of the farthest three columns were surrounded with a wooden platform and casing. The closest two were half poured, but still a good ten stories high, rebar rising a story or two from the completed base. Helen could make out a few men walking on the closest platform, black ants moving back and forth. Then a black spot on the side of the nearest full column slid straight down from the top, like a spider dropping with its line. There was another dark blot as well, hanging lower and to the right of the first. Men strapped into harnesses, she imagined, dangling from the top, doing heaven knows what. It was astounding, really, the construction. Thousands of tons of earth moved, concrete poured, rerouting a river so the land could be cleared, and then erecting something so mammoth right here. The exposed earth was brown and dingy from the summer sun. The backhoes were toys at the base of the dam. From her perspective, better than the costly spot some locals had set up for the tourists on the other side downriver, the landscape looked dwarfed, a kid's toy box. Except Helen knew and couldn't get over, found it hard to believe, the little black dots moving around in the construction were the big hulking men she saw at the lodge. She picked up the binoculars, the plastic casing warmed to the touch from the front seat of the car, and turned the dials to adjust the view. Each little black dot became a stick figure man with a large, colorful, helmeted head. Hi, friends. We're just visiting the construction of a power dam, somebody sitting at her lover's grave. 
It's fascinating. <laughs> Their concrete hand was even more impressive. Its scale increased by the appearance of the slivered arms and legs of the workers. She could make out the thin line of the rope now for the two men scaling the side of the closest structure. What a job, she thought. And with her toes wiggling, she imagined what it was like to be there, suspended along the wall, so many feet up, air all around, nothing but air beneath her. Her heart raced, and by some strange, unaccountable coincidence at that moment, the inky spot of the man on the outside dropped. The straight line of rope supporting him flew up and squiggled itself as he fell like a sack, straight down, with one arm waving in circles. He fell past the other workmen strapped in his harness who must have been surprised to see him pass, mocking the air. It seemed he fell without a sound. A pebble dropped from the sky, a dark twig. He fell with no one to catch him. His body flashed between the metal rebar, a sparrow between iron weeds, and then disappeared behind the concrete. He fell quickly in less time than a breath. Um, I'm going to uh, move ahead. So he falls, the power dam, um, she, she watches the people scurry about in a panic and then sees um, this, sees them pour concrete into the pit where the body was but without having removed the body. So they're essentially burying this guy in concrete because he's died. Um, and because all great books begin with many tragedies on top of each other, uh, she then goes home and realizes they're digging up the body of, or going to soon be digging up the body of her mother in the cemetery. Uh, uh, because when you're building a power dam and you flood the land, you have to dig up the body so that the erosion doesn't make the land go away. Your six feet under is no longer six feet under, and all the corpses would float to the surface. It's fascinating. Never, ne never <laughs> dig up a cemetery. It's grisly work. I called a man to see how it's done. It's exciting. Uh, so then she does return home, and uh, her neighbor is outside and tells her some men had some man had come to see her, and was on the front step, and he went away. And she goes in the house and, and then sees this, that somebody's actually in her backyard. And people have been visiting her regularly because the power dam's being constructed. She hasn't signed any of the paperwork. All these people keep knocking on her door and asking her about this, that, or the other thing because the house is going to be torn down. Um, with her hand on the lock for the back door, she noticed through the glass someone lounging on a patio chair just beneath the back step. A set of legs jutted out men's black shoes. Some man had come to see her about the house and had taken the liberty of making himself at home in her backyard. Mine, she would scream at him. Get off my land. This was still her property. She unbolted the latch, threw open the rear door, and, feeling her body full of adrenaline, flew onto the small back porch. She made it no further. The man had heard the latch and stood up. He was in front of the patio chair with his arms at his sides, like he'd been there a long time, waiting. At first she saw only his suit, a smart black jacket and a rich blue tie. As she drew in air, ready to blast him for his trespass, she stared him in the eye. At the sight of him, her skin prickled and her joints felt turned to rubber. Helen felt the small hairs on her limbs stand up, chills zigzagged across her back and arms. She could think of nothing to say. The sight of him, the simplicity of his body in the yard, not a few feet from her, close enough she could see the color of his eyes, hurt. She said his name on the property for the first time in a decade and a half, Robbie. A set of consonants and vowels so familiar and yet distant to her ear, it was like the ground had been turned to reveal an old toy in a box. Robbie, she said again, just to hear the word. You changed the locks, he said, smiling. It was his voice. Yes, she answered, quieter than she meant. No, no, I'm kidding. I don't have a key. Robbie's tone was apologetic, thinking her short answer a reproof. But I'm afraid that he got the better of me. He gestured to the chair, giving a wry, dismissive laugh. Helen felt the heat of the sun pressing straight into her eyes, yet she couldn't bring herself to blink. Robbie was in the yard. I saw an accident, she wanted to say, but didn't think that a decent hello. Hello. 
She was full of relief, and then she wanted to scream his name to hear it said over and again, but she was silenced by how awkward this was. She wanted to vomit again. She vomited in the cemetery. How changed he was, so adult, so foreign. He was a grown man who shaved neatly. He wore a suit and very handsome tie with blue stitching. His hands were manicured, Helen assumed, for his nails were perfect. He had the hands of a movie star. She couldn't believe he was here, so transformed, so aged and superior. He'd become a man which felt in her heart to be at once a glamorous recreation and the worst betrayal. He was to return as himself. He was to come back, if ever he did, as the boy who disappeared, for them to resume where they had left off, for them to buy the convertible they'd always dreamed of and drive to the coast to see the ocean. He was to sweep her up in his arms and to lift her in the air for her to shout his name so loud and so often that the whole neighborhood would gather round and celebrate that Robbie had returned. He gave a nervous cough then, and Helen's heart slunk back into her chest. She descended the three stairs to the grass. We changed the locks when our first caretaker quit. She touched a hand to her skirt to dry it. Dad didn't want her coming back for the furniture, he said, now that she was out of a job. She flexed her hands, feeling the dry skin of her palms. She put a hand to her damp forehead and closed her eyes. She needed to slow the moment down to catch up with how the world had suddenly remade itself. I think I reveal by now that this is her, this is her brother who's returned. I skipped a little bit. Are you okay? Robbie asked. No, she yelled, and he winced. You're alive, she said. She held a hand to her mouth and shook with tears, repeating the words, You're alive, Robbie. You're alive. You're in my yard. Yes, he said, almost giggling. And the word, the trueness of him standing there to speak it, righted her. She sobered, straightened herself, and sniffed. A bit of a shocker. She didn't laugh with him, and so he said rather formally, I'd like to see our parents. Helen realized by his tone of voice that she was doing a very poor job of welcoming him home. She was no help in putting him at ease. I can take you to them, she said warmly in a quieter voice. Where are they? Just past the Johnson's dairy. Well, it hasn't been a dairy in a decade. Did you, did they sell you the house? Helen's head tipped to the side, slightly puzzling his question. I'm not prying. I don't mean to, but I didn't expect to see you here. I thought you'd be somewhere else. Helen realized that Robbie had made a terrible assumption. She knew no way to decorate it nicely. She said gently, they're dead, Robbie. A moment passed, and he extended his neck slightly in a sort of silent, oh. He hadn't looked her in the eyes since the initial moment of recognition, or perhaps it was that she hadn't looked at him directly. She was busy studying his hands and clothes, his shoulders and trim waist for something of the young Robbie who left. But he looked her in the eye now with an innocent, disappointed candor that pulled her heart apart in halves. There he was in the blue of his eyes, clear and brilliant Robbie. Everything they'd left behind them was in that look between them. Finally, she felt, someone who will understand what's been lost. I would have liked to see mom again, he said, his voice clear and delicate. So they have their little reunion. Uh, the book moves in and out of Robbie and Helen's perspective. So I'm picking up in a new section, and this is Robert. So he's in the house. They've made some tea. He's been vague about where he's been. And um, he excuses himself. And he uh, goes to the washroom. As soon as he set the lock, Robert leaned his head against the door. The painted wood was cool on his forehead and solid. He swiveled his head to press his cheek closer and absorb some of the coolness. He was broiling, overwhelmed. His parents were dead, his father dead. Such a relief to not have to face him, but he'd also been cheated out of that. So many thousands of times he'd imagined the confrontation, months thinking about returning, three weeks planning it. But his father was dead. When he bought his ticket home, when he checked the schedule seven times to make sure he hadn't misremembered the time, when he lied to the restaurant that he wasn't coming in for a week because he was going on holiday to Lake Country, when he told Colin and convinced him not to come, and when his legs buckled three times on the way to the bus depot, his father was already dead. His mother, too. He had imagined she would forgive him instantly, 
the moment she saw him for having stayed away so long, forgiven. And truer than that, he hoped for the reverse, that he'd forgive her. Now that they were both gone, he felt unnerved. There was a terror dormant in how everything was familiar. Everything he'd imagined, the house right here before him, the walls and floor and ceiling surrounding him, an embodiment of so much he feared and longed for. The kitchen, just as he'd remembered it, from the dishes on the counter to the wallpaper on the walls, the curtains, the table and chairs, the beige tiled flooring, the placement of spices on the rack above the stove, the cheap paintings and ornamented mirrors. The front door clicked shut. Helen had left for the neighbors next door. Robert was immobile on the bathroom floor, leaning into the door, breathing heavily, trying to slow his breath, to stop perspiring, to turn off his guts, which were boiling. He was inside his body and outside at once, feeling and not feeling. The bathroom remodel remodeled felt like the safest place in the house. The counter was new, the toilet. A striped towel hanging next to him on the back of the door carried the slight smell of river water, seaweed and algae his sister's swim towel, behind him the smell of plastic from the shower curtain, a fruity soap or shampoo. There was a wisp of hair coiled in the corner in front of him. Robert took a deep breath and pressed his face again into the door. Despite what he'd done, she'd been warm to him. She'd welcomed him. Garrett had been killed so long ago that she'd made her peace with what had happened. Robert wondered how much their parents might have also made peace had he stayed away too long. He'd spent more than a decade away for no reason but his own useless pride, maybe, and all was right here. All was well between him and Helen. Though she'd received her fiancé's ashes, mailed home in a box, still she had embraced Robert. She had forgiven him. She must have. He was pitying himself. There was nothing in her welcome to make him guilty about what had passed. Robert shook with relief. He heard the outside door open and click shut again, Helen's shoes muffled by the living room carpet. He stood quietly, then flushed the toilet to hide his little episode and washed his face in the sink. Stepping out of the bathroom, back into the kitchen with Helen smiling and glassy-eyed as he came into the room, he thought he should just ask her and have it done with. He should just say he was sorry and have a good cry with her about it and move on. Helen shook her head. You seem impossible, Robbie. How did you get here? The bus and then a cab, he answered, and she laughed. Where did you come from, she asked, performing, holding her palms up and looking around. Robert chuckled and stepped to her, then leaned down between her arms and hugged her slim body to him. She wrapped her arms around his shoulders as best she could, so he leaned a little lower to help her get a better grip. I'm sorry, he said quietly, speaking into a mouthful of hair, for why I left. Helen was silent, but gripped him. When they were done, Robert sat down again in his old seat and smiled, sheepish. Helen smiled back. Then her brow wrinkled, and she cupped her iced tea and asked, innocently, why did you leave? And Robert saw in her face that, so many years later, she knew nothing. Uh, well, so many secrets. <laughs> a lot of secrets in my family. I don't know about yours. The older I get, the more there are. It's astounding. I should write about them, and then there'd be fewer secrets. <laughs> but I write about other people's instead. Uh, so I'm going to move well forward into the book. That all uh, takes place in the first 35 pages. Um, and then it just rips along. Um, but I'm going to move to two-thirds of the way through uh, all kinds of things happen, which I won't tell you about, and you don't really need to know them. But uh, Robert leaves, Robbie leaves, Helen and Robbie have a falling out. And she, Helen is slowly coming to, into her own through the course of the book. And I'm going to read a little bit about after um, this, she's had this problem, and then here we are in a new section much later on. There were nights like this after her father died when Helen felt, just by stepping into the house, she traveled beyond any place she could be reached. She'd spent the day tending to Pichet, who is her neighbor, cooking meals for both of them. She'd seen Dave and Bill and watched the house slowly get mounted on wood planks across the street. 
She'd cleaned Pichet's bathroom, which was in a state, and had done a little more work late in the afternoon in both of their gardens. Around nine, she, felt a cord she left a cordless phone on Pichet's nightstand so she could sleep in her own bed, but the second she stepped out of the house, she felt profoundly alone, as though she wasn't even herself anymore, but less than that, less than herself. She wasn't in her own home more than an hour before she couldn't stand the indifference of the walls any longer, the dim light over the sink, the dishes in their rack from the previous day. Helen walked outside in the cool air to the water's edge and stared out at the river. The air was thick with the smell of grass. She listened to, listened to the water licking between the stones and felt lonelier still. The river felt oddly removed. It was an object, a thing out there being manipulated. She owned nothing of what she once took for granted, not the river, nor her home, not even the plants in the yard were hers in any true sense of the word. She had once had dominion, and with her home going, no, it was more than that, with her memories pulled out from under her, her memories corrupted, she hadn't the past that she'd imagined. She hadn't the alternate life in which she'd moved, a shadow self, imagining the home with Garrett, counting his birthdays, their anniversaries. She'd been living make-believe. She pulled the back of her shirt stuck to her skin to get a breeze in there, then had a better thought and removed her shoes, then her socks, sli slipping them inside the empty mouths of canvas. She folded her pants neatly, laying them on top of the shoes, making a pile of clothes. Her bobby pins she slid into the front pocket of her blouse before folding it, and her bra she tucked under the blouse. Her hair, loose on her shoulders, tickled her skin and saddened her, the sensation so sweet and empty. There was that blackness to her mood, like the sky inside her, voided. She inherited this feeling from her father. It's why he drank. It's why she'd hated him and also why she'd pitied him enough to love him. Leaning back on her heel, she slipped her toe into the water and felt drawn out of herself a little, with another sensation, below the water. With the change in temperature, her toe felt separated from the rest of her body, part of something else. She stepped forward, cautious on the slippery stones, feeling the cool water crawl up her body and tickle her skin with sensation, goose-bumping her, until only her head was independent, absurdly floating in the air, hovering above the rest of her. She swam out slowly a few meters, looking to the black water before her, the peaks catching bits of moon and tossing the light around. When she took a breath and jackknifed downwards, pushing her body beneath the surface, the air warm in her lungs, she could feel her body being taken up by the river, the contact a sort of union. She was part of something greater than herself, vulnerable and held, a great watery hand cupping her. Her skin prickled with the temperature, her heart beating steady and clear, a drum against the water. She swam through the river, pushing until she was a few dozen meters from land, a bit breathy and stimulated, her skin alert to the river and air. She turned onto her back and looked up at the stars caught in the netting above her, but they didn't add to the feeling running through her blood. She closed her eyes and floated in the river, present but placeless, a location she could never quite find again and felt the immediacy of the moment. She felt she could crawl out of herself, slide out of her skin like she'd been trapped headfirst inside a sleeping bag and could emerge into the fresh air reborn. She'd step into town a new woman, ready to be held, long and deeply by anyone, anyone kind enough to notice she was alone, anyone with half a care for what she could possibly do to keep herself busy in that house by herself. The water was gorgeous, its cold hands over her everywhere at once. How many nights did she feel ridiculous to be sleeping on one side of the bed, like she was in training? For what? A decade of waiting, denying herself the full use of a bed that was getting no other use, she infuriated herself. What's the point of hoping if there is no reward? And was it optimism? Garrett was dead, the one she knew, and another she didn't, both dead. She swam further out, kicking on her back, the water cold against her as she moved, her breathing steady, measuring her pace, using her abdomen to really push the air, until she was a hundred yards out in the river, surrounded by water, the weeds too deep to brush her legs. Treading water. She felt exceptionally alert, 
looking around, huffing for breath, so much inside herself, so aware of her body and contact everywhere with the river and her head above the waves, surrounded by the night sky, the sound of the water clicking against itself. The river felt alive between her legs. She moved it, kicking lightly, brushing her arms back and forth to stay afloat. Water itched as it dripped off her face. There was an echo in her body to the hug Robbie had given her. She realized she hadn't held anyone since her parents passed. She'd spent her adult life not being held. The water around her felt more real. Her senses were coursing. Her body was a teenager coming alive. Garrett had made her feel this way. Men had seen him dead and filled out paperwork to say as much. He'd been buried. His name was printed in the papers and added to a list. People knew him and had seen him dead. At some point, her hope needed to let him rest. At some point. She looked upstream to the dark outline of the riverbank, which would never, in a few months, look like this again. Nobody would be here seeing this again. It was not that the landscape wouldn't or couldn't change naturally, but that she in her lifetime could not stop this other progress. I think I'm going to leave it there. And yeah, we'll leave it there. And we'll have a little conversation. Oh, yay. Uh, so I, I want to talk a little bit about the book. I always like to read a little about the book rather than give a long preamble, because long preambles are so boring. But postambles, examples, after ambles, are always much more interesting. Uh, and I love to tell the story of how the book came about, because I think it's really interesting. And then if you have any questions that come out of that, well, that's great. And whatever, we'll, you, you'll be embarrassed, and somebody will ask something, and then we'll be fine. Um, I lived in Cornwall, Ontario. I, I grew up there uh, for 19 years, and it's on the St. Lawrence River. And uh, in the 50s, the St. Lawrence Seaway came through. Um, and I worked for the Inverarden Regency Cottage Museum, which was a historical museum. And I, part of my job was to take a lot of the photographs that were taken at the time of the seaway being built um, and catalog them. So I had to find little clues in them to f try to figure out a date and put a little description in it. So if people were going through the archives, they'd be able to, oh, I want a thing with a dump truck from 1957. Okay, here it is. So I'd get a big magnifying glass and look at license plates to see if I can see what year their license plates were. It was lots of fun. So I saw hundreds of photographs of the power dam being built. Um, and I worked for this guy, Ian Bowring, who was a really interesting weirdo. He was a historian. He ran the museum. He employed me. He also wrote a lot of beer books. He was very into beer, so he traveled the country, still travels the country, getting free beer and writing books about them. So Ian was an interesting man who really loved a good story. He spent a lot of time in bars. And so when you spend a lot of time in bars and you're a historian, you, you, you're really good at storytelling. And he told me that when the St. Lawrence Seaway was built in from uh, 55 to 57 or 58, whatever it was, um, they were really behind schedule because the queen was coming to open. So her, her, the queen's visit was planned. You don't change a queen's visit. Um, and they hit this really hard clay that slowed all the construction down. And because they were behind schedule, there was a real press to move on. And some man had fallen to his death in, in the concrete, something like how I described. I don't know quite how he fell to his death. I made it up. Um, fell to his death, and they didn't have time to get the body out, so they just poured concrete over him, and his body remains in the Cornwall power dam, the R.H. Saunders power dam to this day, which is very grim. This happens all the time. There's quite a number of re recorded uh, bodies in the Hoover Dam, for example. Somebody told me that there are also bodies in, oh, what's the name? What's the name of that dam, Trina, up north? Some dam up north. I can't remember it. There's uh, it's like 400 dams in, in BC. I can't remember the name of this dam. Anyway, some dam up north, there's bodies there. The, the guy worked on it. He knew there were bodies. Anyways, I was fascinated by the story. Uh, it, you know, it's so grisly, and, it, and I got tours of the power, everybody gets tours of the power dam when you're a kid and you live in Cornwall. It's one of the only interesting things in Cornwall. So you go to the power dam. 
Um, and I carried the story around for a long time, and I considered using it when I was, wanted to write a novel, and I was like, I don't know how to do that. That's way too complicated for me. I can't write about some man who died. What do I know about power dams? And then when it came time to write my second novel, I sort of took the same approach I had to my first novel. If you want to write a novel, you just sit down and you write a novel and you figure it out. So I thought, well, if I want to write a novel that seems more complicated than I, can, I think I can do, I just need to do it or else I'll never figure it out. So I decided for my second novel I would write something of this story. And I did a lot of research, looked through all, I went to Cornwall and talked to a lot of people who were alive back then and tried to find people. I found people who lived in the communities that were picked up and moved. and. I read a lot of newspapers. I looked at a lot of microfiche. The Globe and Mail very fantastically has a really great searchable database. So I read absolutely everything I could possibly find on the construction of the Seaway. And nowhere in any of the news reports or any of the people I talked to or any of the people who you know, lived there did I find a story about somebody who died in the construction of the power dam, which I thought was fascinating. So maybe Ian was telling a tall tale or maybe Ian was borrowing or misremembering from a different story, but I don't think so. So many of the details were true. They did, the Queen was coming. They were wildly behind schedule. They did hit very hard clay in the construction of the dam, and just nobody bothered to write a news story about it. And it made me wonder, well, why wouldn't you write a news story about somebody dying in the construction of a major project? And when you look through all of the newspapers, they are full of stories about how great the construction of the dam is, how it's going to be wonderful for the community, and there are full page ads in all of the newspapers uh, by all of the construction companies which got enormous contracts. They were building homes, they were digging sewers, they were all these people who uh, were, had outhouses were suddenly getting plumbing in the 50s. It, and so there, it was this huge industrial machine that couldn't be slowed down because the queen was coming and there was an enormous amount of money on the line. And so that, that really solidified a lot of the ideas that I have in the book. The book's called Progress because I'm trying to investigate how we measure progress. What, what do we value? Um, there's, a, there's a nice quote at the beginning of the book that says, uh, it's by John Berger, the 20th century struggle between capitalism and socialism is, at an ideological level, a fight about the content of progress. How you define progress will, determines whether you're a capitalist or a socialist, or capitalism and socialism have their own ideas of what progress is. And so I wanted to investigate some of that. What do we value? Do we value the dollar, or do we value the interaction of the people in this room, for example? And in some ways uh, I think I was successful and in other ways I, I don't, you know, I think I have a more complicated book that needs to be written to hit that maybe a little deeper. Uh, but that's how the book came about, which I think is a very fascinating story. <laughs> so are there any, do you guys have any questions? We have, I don't know, we have maybe 20 minutes to have a conversation. which means you can tell your own stories, that conversations are two ways. It, I love to kind of ask, sometimes I like reversing it as a Q&A, but I get to ask the questions and the audience comes up with the answers. Mm -hmm. Has anyone ever heard of people dying in, in the power dams being buried before? Oh, that's nice, where? Uh, to the iron workers. In the morning. Were people buried in that one? I think a few people. Oh, so juicy. Anywhere else? Wasn't there a big accident on the Iron Workers Memorial? Like, there were. That's why it's called the Iron Workers Memorial. I think. How many? How many? Well, I don't know where the exception fell. Yeah. The exception fell to a bunch of people down with it because they were tied to it. So they would, so that if they fell, they would be safe. But it ended up drowning because they were tied to it. That's so brutal. Oh, dear. It's a dark world. I should have wrote that story. Lots of stuff written about that. The nice thing about not having much of a news report is that you get to just make it all up on your own. I uh, had, so this isn't a historical novel. I didn't set it in Cornwall, and I didn't set it in the 50s. I tried very hard. I, I thought about it for a long time, and I thought I was going to write a historical novel. And then I realized that if I wrote a book about a certain time and place,
people would hold it up to, you know, well, was I accurate about that time and place? And the story isn't about that time and place. Like, what I'm interested in the story is about the decisions we're making now and the way we treat each other now. And I didn't think that researching a time that I didn't live in was going to be very helpful. And somebody said to me, and it really rang true, that writing historical fiction in a time where you didn't live, or even a time you did live, is like writing science fiction, because you have to make up a world that you don't know. Um, you have a few more clues, but you also have a lot more people who are going to tell you it wasn't like that. And I didn't want anybody to tell me it wasn't like that, because it's not about, a, it, you know, it wasn't about the past tense, it was about the present tense. It's okay to say it's not like this, but I didn't care to have them say it wasn't like that. So what I decided to do, I, for a little while, a very short while, somebody as a joke said, you should put a murder in your book and you should set it in the future. And so I kind of have, you know, it's kind of like a murder. It's a cover-up death in my book. And I was thinking about setting it in the future. And then I thought to myself, because I've realized, I thought to myself, what would John Berger do? Because I'm very fond of John Berger. He's, you know, this great writer. I thought, what would John Berger do? And then I had this great, as soon as I asked myself, I knew the answer. I was like, he would set it in a perpetual present. Because what else do you do in order to combat progress, but you have an ever now? You know, there is no progress. There is only the now. There's only the people in this room and how we interact with each other. That's the reality we know. So I've realized, you know, a great thing out of that exercise is if you think you're not bright enough to solve a solution, imagine you're somebody much smarter than yourself. <laughs> and that is the great power of the imagination. It is a really keen, you know, what would Oprah do? People do it all the time. But it really is a very, it's very helpful. So John, my idea of John Berger is definitely sharper than my own idea of myself which is fine. Uh, uh, so I tried when I was writing the book to make all of the references seem quite universal. At, at first I thought, well, I wouldn't put any telephones in it. And then I thought, well, like any cell phones. And I thought, well, if I don't put any cell phones in it, well, then it will immediately feel like a historical book. Because from here on in, we're going to have cell phones unless we get some major disaster and then nobody's going to read my book anyways. <laughs> So I tried to put in, you know, car company, like she drives a Chevy, because I figure, well, the Chevys will be around for a while. They've been around for a while. They have good historical, you know, grounding. And I tried really hard not to put too many things in that would put it in a place. I picked plants that are fairly, uh, uh, you know, they're kind of everywhere. Liz? I was actually noticing that in that scene that you uh, read in the kitchen. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. You mentioned spices on a rack. You mentioned, you know, different objects in the kitchen. But the only thing that you mentioned that was specific, like really specific, was the brown linoleum. I think. Uh huh. Beige linoleum. And I, was, I thought it was really interesting that you didn't mention. You know, it wasn't like Mrs. Dash on the on the in the spice rack. Uh huh. Like, you know, a particular brand of toaster or something like you weren't you weren't zooming in at, at that level of detail. And I was, I, was, I was finding it a little frustrating. I was like, oh, you know, because I love detail. Well, this is the interesting thing, right? It's so counter to what you teach. When you teach creative writing, you say, be specific. And I would go through and circle people's papers and say, look, you can be much more, you know, much more concrete about this and really be. So it's, real, it's been a real trick for It was a real trick for me writing it, trying to, uh, trying to keep the book at a certain distance so that it feels like a, a very universal story. Usually it's the opposite. Usually when you're trying to get a very universal theme, you go for a very specific story. It's kind of the classic of what you teach. The more specific it is, the more unique, the more absolutely it's Romeo and Juliet and nobody else, the more we're going to identify with it and think it's magical and wonderful because it's creating a place that's so evocative. And yet, I took an, the opposite approach and I I think it works. I feel like, it, like it's successful for me. I tried to pull back a little bit so that it is a little more generic, but the situations and, and the, the personalities within those situations are unique enough that they feel specific, but the place has a certain everywhere quality to it. That's what I was hoping for, that it would start to feel more like a, like a large allegory. The, the Georgia Strait uh, 
re when they reviewed it, they, they sort of ended by saying that it's like, they, like progress is like an allegory for living. It's an allegory for how we treat each other, which I really liked because it's exactly what I was going for, was trying to turn it into, uh, you know, like Hansel and Gretel. You never know that Mrs. Dash is on the witch's, uh, you know, shelf whenever. That's not what she's going to spice them with in the pot she's going to throw them in. But we still have a very clear sense of that story. I was sort of going for a broader feel. I'm glad it frustrated you, though. That's good. Well, it, it, it frustrated me for a moment, and then, and then I, I felt myself settle into it and, you know, had my own Mrs. Dash on the comic place. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is don't do product placement. There's, there's very little product placement. There's a little bit. You know, like the Chevy. There is a Chevy. I'm fond of Chevys. I like to put Chevys in. Chevy, you know, it's such a thing. Any other questions or comments? Complaints? Well, that you have to get the, you have to get the book to find that out. I don't dare tell people because it's the midpoint climax. Where do you, where do you write? Do you have one? Where do I write? Oh, yeah, I write kind of anywhere. I used to write everywhere. Like I used to carry a little booklet with me, and I would keep a little. I'd write little notes down, and I'd be in the middle of a conversation, and I would write things, and friends would think I was crazy. And then I stopped doing that because uh, I just got. I started writing longer work, and so. I still write little notes to myself, not nearly as much. But I think because I've start, when I started writing longer work, I stopped keeping little notebooks with me. And I thought that was weird, and I tried to keep the notebook with me, but I never used it. And I think it's because the longer work takes up so much more space, it needs more time. It doesn't come to me in tiny little bursts much anymore. Occasionally, I'll get a little thing. I'll be like, oh, I better write that down, and I will. But. Uh, I tend to you know, have a few hours where I sit to work on fiction. In the summer times, I teach. So in the summer times, I go to my office. I try to go five days a week, and I write all morning. So I'll write from 8 or 9, whenever I get there, till noon or 1. I'll write till lunch. And then I've done my writing for the day, and if I want to go back and do more writing, I can. But if I want to read something else instead, or do editing, or do other businessy things, I'll do that. But during the school year, all I have room in my head for is my students, because I love my students. And I don't want to, I had a lot of teachers who were wonderful. And I had a few teachers who were very occupied with their own careers. And students would talk about it. They'd be like, oh, you know, so-and-so, he's only thinking about his own work. He's not thinking about mine. He doesn't give it any time. And I do not want to be one of those teachers, because they're paying me to do this job. So. I don't write much during the school year at all, unless I have a deadline. Like somebody says, hey, write this piece for event. And then I'll write this little piece for event, and then that'll be it. Yes? No, you're so clever. This is Liz Bichinsky, who's one of the most famous Canadian poets in the country. It's very nice for her to sit in the front row. Hi, Liz. OK, I just, this is sort of, I just want to, you gave me the best advice once about writing prose. Oh, yeah. Which was that... Um, Copy me. Do everything I do. Yeah, do everything Michael does, because he's, he's so wonderful. But, what was it? OK, it was that you said that every day that when you write, that stop writing before you're done. Oh, Something yeah. Like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you talk a little bit oh, it's about? great advice. I love it. Who gave me that advice? Maybe I made it up. <laughs> no, somebody gave it to me, but I don't remember. Uh, you don't write when you think you've hit the end of a scene. You write until you think you're almost at the end of a scene. You know, because you write and you get to the end of something and then you stop and then you go away and then you come back and you have to look at the blank page and be like, I don't know what to do next. So you write and when you think you're almost done, you're like, I'm almost done, I'm going to stop there. So then when you go away, you come back, you know what you have to finish and you finish it, and then you just do, 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 you just keep going with the next thing so that you're, you're, it's still fresh and alive for you and you're not trying to you know, make a new baby without a boyfriend, which can be really tricky, you know? <laughs> Something like that. It's a complicated metaphor, but you'll get there in the end. <laughs> Any other questions 
Oh, in the very back. Um, what do you do when, when you have like, layers blocked? Or do we do that with yourself? Well, you just suck it up. <laughs> Somebody told me that they didn't believe in writer's block, and I really like to say I don't believe in writer's block. Writer's block just means you don't want to write something shitty. Because you could always write, I have writer's block, which is writing and this is stupid, and I'm having a terrible time, and I really hate myself, and I might never write again, and if only I wouldn't have bought that apple this morning, and that person would have been mean to me, I might be in a better mood, and I might be able to write, but I'm not writing, blah, blah, blah. You can always write crap. Writer's block is, I think, simply not giving yourself permission to write crap. So my mother always said, it doesn't have to be perfect, just done, which is advice that got mentioned at lunch today. And I am very fond of that advice, is you have to have permission to play. And playing means you get your hands dirty. And if you get your hands dirty, it's because you're mucking around in shit. So you have to give yourself permission to muck around in shit, which is another way of playing. Just do whatever terrible. Because you can fix things. That's the trick, right? It isn't first drafts isn't writing. That's not writing. Writing is not creating a first draft. Writing a first draft is being an amateur. Revising the first draft is being a professional. So if you revise the first draft, that's being a writer. If you write the first draft, that's not a writer. That's a hobbyist. You know, you're just dabbling. It's like saying, I don't know. It's just like saying that. Uh, so really, it's all about permission. I try really hard to get my to give my students permission. Like I try to be the weirdest person in the room so they have enough permission to kind of be weird. You know, I get to be the flakiest person there so they can be flaky. We talk about, you know, I, I want to change the world, I tell them in my first that's why I write books, because I want to change the world. I want to make the world a better place. It's a big, grand, huge, loving gesture to the universe. And so they get to make write for whatever reason they want, because I get to be the flaky person who says the flaky thing. And it's the same kind of thing with permission, with other kinds of permission. You know, like I get to write crap. I can just make up crap right here. Look, here's some crap. Look, I made it up. OK, what are we going to do with it? How are we going to make it better? So that you're, and it's not so precious. That's the thing. It only gets precious with time and effort. But it doesn't come out as precious. You know, a diamond isn't made in a day. It takes eons. The Earth has spent a long time investing in that carbon. <laughs> So, permission, a new novel by Michael. Permission, yeah, the next novel. <laughs> permission. It'll be really dirty. <laughs> That'll be fun. So, yeah, there's so <laughs> permission. Maybe I will write that book. That'd be fun. <laughs> Writing a book called Permission. Oh God, so many orgies. <laughs> so great. After my first novel is very tender and intimate, and people are sad in it, and I said, OK, my next book's going to be funny. And then I wrote this book where somebody falls to his death, and their parents are being dug up, and the brother who's run away from home returns, and his parents are dead. And I was like, that's not a happy book. <laughs> it's, it's an, it might be an optimistic book in the end, but it's not a happy book. So permission, that sounds like a happy book. Permission to write permission. You can do anything in that book, and they can't really give you a bad byline, you know? <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, great. Thanks so much for coming, you guys. Yay!